ESD Now episode 295, Fun with F Unlink at, recorded on the 24th of April 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Kreuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Welcome to our uh, episode this week. We have a little bit of a different setup at Alan's side, but I'm still the same in my place here, so that shouldn't uh, disturb you too much. So we yeah, should get uh, right into the headlines. You, uh, coming to you live from the Jupiter Broadcasting Studio, as you can see behind me here. Uh, we didn't actually do a green screen, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, Alan didn't do any redecorating at home. No. So <laughs> just this week. And um, yeah, we should bring you the headlines for this week, uh, starting with introducing F Unlink at. Yeah, so another blog post from our friend Mario Saborski explaining how it turns out every file you've ever deleted on a Unix machine was probably susceptible to a race condition. Mm. Um <laughs> Yeah, so one of the first syscalls that was ever created on a Unix-like system was Unlink. Um, you know, on FreeBSD, this means it's syscall number 10, which is, you know, a very low number. Uh, and in Linux, the number is dependent on the architecture, but most of them, it's usually the 10th one again, because of history. Uh, this indicates that it was one of the primary syscalls that was first created uh, when the concept of system calls was invented. Um, the Unlink system call is very simple and will basically provides you provide uh, the path of a file, and that file gets removed. Uh, as the name suggests, it's actually being unlinked from the directory that it's in rather than actually being removed, right? The removing file process itself is interesting, so we'll take a minute to look at that. Uh, first, by removing the file, we're actually removing a link from the directory to that file. Uh, in Unix-like file systems, we can have many links to a single file, right? You have hard links. So just because you unlink one of the entries that points from a directory with a file name to that specific uh, file on the disk doesn't mean that that file is now deleted. We've just removed one of the links. And it's only in the case once a file has zero links to it that that actually becomes free space. So when we remove all the links to a file, the file system can mark all those blocks uh, as not being used anymore. Uh, and depending on the file system, that might actually be very different, but let's not jump into how ZFS works right now. Uh, this is why the process is called unlinking and not, you know, delete file or remove file or something like that. Uh, while we unlink the file, two or three different things might happen. First, we'll remove an entry from the directory um, with that file name. So now, you know, the file foo.txt will not be in user home Benedict anymore. Uh, but we also have to decrease the reference count in the inode. So in the file system, each unique file has a unique ID number, basically in the index that says where this file is. And now we're going to reduce its reference count because now there are one fewer links to it. And if that reference count drops to zero, uh, then we get to mark all that space as free. Uh, which doesn't mean the blocks on the disk will be filled with zeros or anything. Uh, that's more up to the file system and, and the configuration and so on. Uh, but in most cases, it just means you mark those blocks as free and they'll get overwritten next time you write something new to that location. Uh, but uh, this mostly means that remove a file from a directory is an operation on the directory and not necessarily on the file itself. You know, you're maybe updating the count in the inode, but you're not actually touching the data on disk. You're just updating the directory that the file happens to be in. Mm. Uh, so another interesting subject is what happens if our system will perform only the first of those steps. Uh, and that depends on the file system and something, you know, we'd have to leave for another time. So, you know, if it's a hard link and you only have to remove it from the one directory and maybe lower the reference count but not free the space, but that's not really a problem. So uh, the problem with the unlink and unlink at system calls is that they're susceptible to this race condition because they don't provide any guarantee uh, that you're actually unlinking the file you hoped to unlink. Uh, when you delete a file using its name, you have no guarantee that someone has not already deleted that file or renamed that file and then possibly created a new file or renamed a different file to the name you're trying to delete. Right? Oh. So when you do unlink or unlink at, you provide the name that you want to remove. Uh, but in the time between you decided on which file you wanted to delete and you asked the system to delete it, something could have changed. Uh, so when you delete a file uh, using its name, you, again, you have to get here, uh, we have some stats about the file that we want to unlink. We perform some tests. Uh, you know, sometimes that's, you know, who owns the file and do we have permissions and so on. Uh, and sometimes another process will have removed that file and recreated the file. 
right? So if if you're about to tr say go delete var log messages, but it happens to be around midnight and new syslog is just renamed var log messages to var log messages dot zero and created a new empty file called var log messages. Uh, well, when you call unlink, uh, you're between the time you decide my log file is too big, I want to delete it, and when you go to delete it, it's been moved and some new file has been created, and now you just deleted the wrong file. Uh, hmm. And so, Oops. what do we do? You know, it's a classic race condition. So, uh, many programs will perform checks before trying to remove a file to make sure that it's the correct file or that you have the permissions or uh, whatever, and that exposes what's called a time of check versus time of use class of bug, where when we checked it was the right file, but when we went to go delete it, it wasn't the right file anymore. Just because somebody else, you know, there's always a chance at a multi-user or multi-threaded system that someone else might have touched the file or did something in between. Um, so, you know, we checked that the file that I'm about to remove is the right one, the one I created yesterday, and uh, if it is, then I call unlink. However, between when I checked and when I actually called unlink, some other program might have moved the file and put a different one in that place or something. Uh, you know, especially if it was someone malicious, they might have managed to swap it with some file I they couldn't delete, but I could, uh, and caused uh. me to delete the wrong thing or something. You know, interesting mm -hmm. way to uh, cover up the logs of something you were doing is can make it look like somebody else deleted them, not you just by renaming <laughs> them to the, the name of something that they were about to delete or whatever. Huh. Ah, so in Unix-like operating systems, we get a handle uh, for a file called a file descriptor when you open the file. Uh, the file descriptor guarantees us that all operations that we are going to perform uh, are on the same file, that same inode. No matter what its name changes to or how it gets changed or even if it gets deleted, right? If, you have a, if your web server has a log file open, um, and is writing to it, and you delete the file, you often notice that you don't actually get the space back until you restart the web server uh, or until it does log rotation because as long as somebody's got that file open, it's still in use. Uh, and mm. so they're still writing to that log file, and you know it's just not going to end up uh, as a file you can read because it's been deleted. But um, Yeah, so uh, the file script guarantees that we're always working with the same file even if its name changes or something. Uh, so if someone was to unlink a number of directory entries, the operating system will not actually free the structures behind those file descriptors while they're still open. Um, and that's why we have things like the fstat command, which allows you to get its, uh, you know, use stat on a file and you see the information about that file. But we have the command fstat, which is give me the information on this file descriptor. Uh, because maybe I don't know what the file's called, uh, especially if you're looking at something like uh, working inside a capsule code sandbox, uh, you were handed an already open file because you're not allowed to know where the file is in the file system or whatever. Uh, so we already know that the file may have many links on the disk, uh, which point to a single inode. So right, you can have multiple names for the same file. Uh, what happens when we open the file? Uh, simplifying, the kernel creates a memory representation of the inode called a vnode, uh, and this uh, single operation uh, is used, or that single representation, the vnode, is used for all the open copies of the file, even if, you know, 100 different people have that file open. Uh, if in a process we open the same file, the same inode, using different names, uh, for example via hard links, all of these files will be linked to the single vnode. Uh, this means that the path name is not necessarily stored in the kernel because there could be multiple path names. Uh, yep. So this is basically the reason why we don't have an f unlink function, uh, where you could just delete a file by its file descriptor because it'd be ambiguous, right? There's actually four links to this file. Which one are you trying to remove? Uh, and so on. Um, so uh, if we performed an fd unlink or f unlink syscall, the kernel wouldn't know which directory entry we need to go remove this file from. Another problem is more architectural. As we discussed earlier, unlinking is really an operation on the directory, not on the inode itself. Uh, so using funlink um, on a file descriptor uh, may create some confusion because we are not removing the inode representing the, uh, by that file descriptor. We are actually performing an, a, uh, an action on the directory, and you know, in a capsule sandbox, you don't know where that directory is. 
Cool. Uh, so after some discussion, we decided the only sensible option for FreeBSD would be we create the new f unlink at function. Um, so this actually takes the file descriptor you want to delete, the path, so the file name you want to delete, uh, or sorry, the descriptor for the directory, the file name you want to delete, the file descriptor proving you already have that file open, and then the optional flags. Uh, so this syscall only performs additional sanity checks if we are removing a directory entry which corresponds to the inode uh, referenced by the file descriptor we passed. Um, so we tell it which directory, we tell it the file name, and we tell it the file descriptor, and only if that name and that descriptor match will it actually remove the file. That way if somebody's renamed something or moved it or anything's happened, it will say, sorry, I couldn't delete that file because the race condition happened. Uh, mm -hmm. The API... Um, will check if the path opened relative to that directory file descriptor points to the same vnode. Uh, and you know, thanks to that, we've now removed the race condition uh, because all of these sanity checks are performed in the kernel while the file system is locked, so no other change can be happening in between the check and the delete. And uh, in addition to providing this extra stuff for the Capsicum sandbox, it also has the very useful purpose of making multi-threaded programming safer. Uh, you know, when you have a multi-threaded program, you just need to make sure that one part of your program isn't writing to the file while the other part's deleting it, right? Uh, or sure. vice versa, um, and so on. So the file descriptor parameter can also be set to the FD none uh, macro, uh, which will mean that the sanity check should not be performed, and F unlink at will behave just like unlink at, and that's because the unlink at has basically been replaced with F unlink at with calling it. It just calls the other one with that extra parameter. Uh, as you can notice, uh, we often refer to the unlink syscall, uh, but in the end, the APIs look, or if you call unlink, you're actually nowadays calling unlink at anyway. And so switching that to actually calling f unlink at wasn't uh, any more difficult. Okay. Uh, so yeah, these days, unlink is simply using the same code as unlink at. Yeah, so we don't need to rewrite the whole <laughs> whole operating system just for that uh, system right. call. But or more importantly, we don't end up with two different unlink at functions uh, that are kind of copy and pasted of each other. Instead, mm -hmm. everything's actually using the new f unlink at by just calling it with the you know the file descriptor set to none, uh, so that it falls back and works the same way as it always did before. Good. Yeah. So thank you to Marius for writing that up because it was actually a uh, slightly complicated. Uh, concept and it makes it easier for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, upgrading an OpenBSD router with AT&T Uverse uh, over at Josh Rustin's blog. And he writes, I upgraded to AT&T's Uverse gigabit internet service in 2017 and it came with an RSBGW210 uh, as the Wi-Fi AP access point and router. So the BGW210 is not, is not a terrible device, but I already had my own Airport Extreme access point wired throughout my house and an OpenBSD router configured with various things. So I had no use for this device. It's also a potentially insecure device and has a link to more information about that uh, that you can't upgrade or fully disable a remote control over. So fully removing that BGW uh, is not possible, as we'll see later, but it is possible to remove it from the routing path. And that's how he did it with OpenBSD. So in uh, 802.1x, uh, when the service was originally installed by AT&T, a fiber optic cable terminated at an ONT in his basement, which then connected to the BGW210 via Ethernet. So he tried swapping his OpenBSD router in place of the BGW, but it could not get a DHCP lease or receive any traffic from the ONT, despite a properly negotiated Ethernet connection. So after some uh, packet capturing uh, between the ONT and the BGW, he learned that the BGW does 802.1x EAP authentication with a certif certificate installed on a device and all traffic is encapsulated in an 802.1q uh, VLAN with a VLAN ID of zero. Uh, until this negotiation is performed, the upstream device will not respond. And so you had to proxying that, uh, or had to proxy this EAP. Uh, while he's not the first person to want to use their own router at AT&T's Uverse service, so there are already some software solutions out there for proxying the EAP. And so he went to EAP underscore Parrot uh, since it was small and written in Go, 
and it only needed minor changes to support OpenBSD, which the author has since merged. So you can see uh, the package at go command and uh, pulling down some of the dependencies and building those. And then it's just needing a small configuration file uh, in EAP underscore parrot uh, dot TOML. And that has a network section and uh, needs to needs to know about the devices for the uh, remote servers and the router interface and some uh, information about uh, logging and uh, some stuff that should be ignored. And after that file is uh, created, an etc rcd uh, eap parrot script can be created and then enabled to run on boot with rcctl. And then uh, the daemon should start at your uh, next reboot. And after a test run with EAP Parrot, uh, he was able to get an IP from OpenBSD via DH client. And so here's a little picture of his uh, network setup. And so, uh, this is of course, an ASCII diagram, because why not? And you can see how the setup works and which IPs are on which uh, side of the, the switch and of the uh, BGW. And so it uh, continues uh, with setting up the host names and for the VLAN 0 and the EM0 network card so that everything has a nice name that you can remember without remembering IP addresses. And further down, there's a section about IPv6 setup. So because at and uses DHCP v6 for IPv6 connectivity, he's using the DHCP CD package for both IPv4 and IPv6 DHCP. And there's the DHCP CD config file so that people know how to set that up. And of course, uh, further down, there is uh, the rest of the setup showing how the packages are uh, looking inside uh, in a wire, uh, well, it could be wire uh, shark capture or just TCP dump. And um, at the end, you can see that the long string sent at the DUID must be configured with the HCP CD. And that's a little edit for your um, DUID setup. So that has the UID in it. So that's fairly straightforward. And you can see, even if you're on some proprietary hardware, you can still put in some OpenBSD or some open source software in there. Yeah, you know, a lot of the cable companies have the remote provisioning stuff set up so that they can just send a new configuration to your router. Uh, and, you know, if you've changed some things, having them just undo it with their thing uh, mm. is annoying and you know for privacy reasons sometimes you don't want your isp to have access to do things like that and yeah uh it's interesting that at is using the authenticated ethernet stuff to actually uh prevent rogue devices uh causing problems on their network or even possibly for people trying to steal you for surface i don't know uh <laughs> but it's nice that they managed to get that to work All right, time for the news roundup this week. We have a how to use NetBSD on a Raspberry Pi for you this time. And uh, a lot of people have sent us uh, tutorials about the Raspberry Pi, but this one is covering NetBSD. And um, uh, asking around, the, do we have an old Raspberry Pi lying around gathering dust, maybe after a recent Pi upgrade? Are you curious about the BSD Unixes? And if you answered yes to both of these questions, you'll be pleased to know that the first is the solution to the second, <laughs> because you can run NetBSD as far as the very first release on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is op uh, over at opensource.com. And uh, the article explains a little bit what uh, BSD is for the people who don't know, but I guess for the people watching this show, it doesn't need any more introduction. Yeah, although so, sometimes it's interesting to see how people that maybe don't know that much about BSD describe what BSD is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, in, in, in short, uh, BSD is the Berkeley software distribution of Unix. In fact, that's the only open source Unix with direct li lineage back to the original source code written by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson at Bell Labs. I think that's a good description. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So um, uh, admittedly, NetBSD isn't an operating system that's perfectly suited for the Pi. It's a minimal install compared to many Linux distributions designed specifically for the Pi, and not all components of recent Pi models are functional under NetBSD yet. However, it's arguably an ideal operating system for the older Pi models since it's lightweight and lovingly maintained. And if nothing else, it's a lot of fun for any diehard Unix geek to experience another side of the POSIX world. 
So first of all, download NetBSD. Uh, there are different versions of BSD. NetBSD has cultivated a reputation or for being lightweight and versatile. And it offers an image of the latest version of the OS for every version of the Raspberry Pi since the original. So you can find the right one for your little uh, Pi. And uh, to download the version of your Pi, you must first determine what variant of the ARM architecture your Pi uses. And you can find that um, here in the article, they're using a Raspberry Pi Model B revision 2 uh, that has the two USB ports and no mounting holes. And first, according it, to it's the, interesting because then they also have the Raspberry Pi 2, which is different than a Model B 2, uh, yeah. which is like the first one and then the second revision. of Because with the first Raspberry Pi, there was an A and B, which were different amounts of memory or whatever and had different prices. And then they had mm -hmm. a Rev 2. And then I think also later versions of the Raspberry Pi 2 are actually a Raspberry Pi 3 with less stuff on it or something. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's not NetBSD's fault, it's Raspberry Pi's fault, but there are a lot of different versions of the Pi and you do have to get the image for the right one. Yeah, so in this case, they needed the eARM uh, V6HF in NetBSD's architecture notation. And so uh, after downloading that, um, for the easiest and quickest install, use the binary image instead of an installer. And to use the image uh, is the most common method of getting an operating system onto your Pi. You copy the image to your SD card and boot it up. Uh, no install necessary, it's already prepared for you. And images files are found in the binary uh, gzimg directory of the NetBSD installation media server, uh, which you can reach from the front page of NetBSD. And the image is rpi.img.gz, uh, which is just a compressed IMG file. So you g unzip this one, and then you have the IMG file ready to be copied onto the SD card. They talk a little bit about how to do that using Etcher, but you can also use uh, the D command, which is shown uh, below. So you do uh, the location as the if uh, rpi.image. Be prepared uh, to use the proper OF, the, where the image should be written to. Don't write it to your main hard disk or any other devices other than your uh, memory card. And use a block size of two megabytes and hence, status equals hence progress. using the, the etch, etcher utility on a regular computer. <laughs> yeah, just yes. to make sure you're uh, not making any mistakes and overwriting uh, right. vital well, partition. Uh, or, you know, if the Raspberry Pi is going to be your first NetBSD computer, you might not have another BSD or Linux that has a DD command. Yeah, that's true. So either one of the two uh, will do. And then it's up to the first boot. The first time it's booted, NetBSD detects that the SD card's file system does not occupy all the free space available and resizes the file system accordingly, which could take a while depending on the size. But um, after a while, the growing is done. You can see from the output what's what it's doing. And once that is done, the Pi reboots and re uh, presents you with a login prompt. Log into your NetBSD system using root as the username with no password. And then you can set up user accounts. That's pretty straightforward using passwd, setting a password for the root user first thing, and then using user add to add a user, in this case, uh, Seth. And that user is part of the wheel group, which can do um, administrative uh, changes to the root user. And of course, you do passwd Seth02, so that user also has a different password, hopefully, than the root user. And then uh, it continues with adding software uh, to NetBSD. For that, you need to have um, their ready-made pre-compiled packages. Uh, they're on NetBSD servers, and you need to tell the uh, install tool how to find this path, so the package path variable needs to be set. And that's a bit of a long URL, uh, but it basically points to the NetBSD FTP, and that has the, um, you need to replace that with the uh, port, that you're, re you're having and the version. In this case, it's the ERM V6HF or either if you have a newer model of the Pi, then the ERM V7HF. And then once that is done, uh, you can use package underscore add, uh, for example, dash V for the, to getting your uh, bash or whatever software you want to have. Don't install KDE on a Pi. It's not going to go well, but small utilities could um, go a long way, making your Pi a little bit more useful. And then talking about Pseudo, uh, that's also pretty straightforward. And yeah, then you already have your nice little pie 
uh, setup with, oh, they also do uh, Fluxbox installation. So you have a little bit of a GUI if you yeah. need one. Not sure it how quick that HDMI would output. be. The whole point of the Raspberry Pi is to get up to a TV or something, right? So. Yeah. And so, yeah, that way you have NetBSD running and your Pi can be useful in many different ways. Yep. Cool. Nice tutorial. So on to our next story, uh, which is about ZFS native encryption. Uh, ah. so this is uh, another post by Chris Seibenman uh, for the University of Toronto. And he says, one of the big upcoming features that a bunch of people are looking forward to in ZFS is the natively encrypted file systems. Uh, this is already in the main development branch of ZFS on Linux, uh, which I think released its final release candidate this week. Uh, and is going to make it into FreeBSD uh, as part of the new Z uh, ZFS on FreeBSD, which is a port of the newer ZFS on Linux features to FreeBSD. Uh, the call for testing for that went out last week as well. Uh, so if you want to test out the newer version of uh, ZFS on FreeBSD, uh, it's available uh, as a port uh, for FreeBSD 12 stable or 13. It requires newer stuff that's not been released yet. Uh, or there's a pre-built images you can download because... Uh, uh, Installing the ZFS package from ports requires building a system that doesn't have ZFS in the base. Uh, otherwise, the ZFS commands in like user bin or whatever are not going to be in sync with what kernel module you load. Anyway, um, there's instructions and images already built. Uh, they're up. You can find them on the FreeBSD stable or FreeBSD file systems mailing list archive if you aren't subscribed. Uh, anyway, so you can test out. Uh, some of the stuff on FreeBSD already. Anyway, uh, Chris goes on to say it will likely make it into Illumos as soon as the Illumos people are uh, get around to pulling it in. They've been testing it for a while and finding bugs, so that's good. And he says, people are looking forward to native encryption so much, in fact, that some of them have started using ZFS and Linux already, either using the development branch 0 0.8 uh, or some of the release candidates like RC3. People uh, either doing this or planning to do this uh, show up on the ZOL mailing list uh, quite often, sometimes with problems. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a good idea, uh, despite ZFS on Linux uh, being in the 0 0.8 release candidate stage. Instead, we should avoid using ZFS encryption until it's part of an official release, uh, because if too many people start using it before it's in a release, the problem is that it makes it much harder to, to make on-disk format changes and so on. Mm. Uh, Unlike uh, garden variety features and changes to ZFS on Linux, where the development tree has historically been more completely solid and problem-free, ZFS encryption is such a significant change that people are still routinely, uh, routinely finding bugs and needing to make serious changes, including changes to the on-disk format that require you to back up and restore your encrypted files. And uh, he's got links to some cases where that's already happened. Mm -hmm. He says, this particular change is far uh, from the only encryption-related problem that have been uh, that have come up. Uh, I follow the development tree and read every commit's description, and I've seen quite a lot of commits that fix various encryption-related issues. Uh, it really seems that people are still frequently finding corner cases that haven't been considered or uh, just never encountered before. Despite ZFS on Linux's relatively extensive test suite, ZFS send and receives seem to be an especially problematic area, but my memory is that even uh, ordinary use hasn't been trouble-free. So, uh, if you have a strong need for combining encryption and ZFS today, I think that you need to stick to the older approaches, like ZFS on top of Lux or Geom, uh, Gelly or whatever. Uh, otherwise, you should probably just wait. Um, the most that people should be doing with ZFS encryption today is doing test drives and getting experience with it. Uh, you should definitely not use it for data you care about. You know, you need to have backups if you're going to start using this. Because uh, we'd like people to use it uh, and test it and find the bugs so we can fix them, but we don't want anybody to count on it such that they're going to lose their data. Because uh, you know, we really don't want ZFS to have a reputation for losing people's data. That's It's hard to mm -hmm. recover from. Uh, you know, ask some of the other file systems that have had these problems. Um, so he says, I know uh, this seems odd given that ZFS on Linux is up to release candidate three, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm a bit surprised that ZFS on Linux has been doing uh, the RC uh, series with encryption so apparently unstable, but I'm sure that there have been reasons. Uh, have you, uh, 
it's even possible that ZFS on Linux 0.8 will not actually include encryption. It might get turned off at the last minute uh, just to save it to release. Uh, at this point, uh, the developers probably don't want uh, to disable the code outright, but they might fence it off behind some warnings so that trying to enable it uh, requires you know, setting a tunable and say, I agree that this might shoot me in the foot. Um, it says, it's also possible that encryption has turned out to be more tangled and troublesome than anyone initially expected uh, when the feature was first added. And that is uh, only through the early enthusiastic people jumping on it that we've actually found these problems sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah, and it says, uh, P.S. I expect that FreeBSD people won't have to worry about this unless they're purposely using the new um, ZFS from ports. Yeah. So it's coming, but uh, testing is important before putting vital data at risk. Yes, and no matter what, you should always have backups. Yeah, that aren't encrypted, <laughs> because otherwise, mm, how do I get my data back? Um, well, they can yeah, be encrypted, but, but they should be encrypted not using the <laughs> same feature, like using Gilly yes. or something uh, for the backup, so that if something goes wrong with one of them, you still have the other one. Mm. Okay, we look forward to that, and I guess we'll see more of that in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we have more uh, tutorials in this type. Uh, we have a tutorial on rump kernel servers and clients over at NetBSD um, Docs, and they uh, have an introductory part. Rump any kernel architecture allows you to run highly component componentized kernel component configurations in user space processes. Coupled with the RUMP sysproxy facility, it is possible to run loosely distributed client-server mini operating systems. Since there is a minimum configuration and the bootstrap time is measured in milliseconds, these environments are very cheap to set up, use, and tear down on demand. So this document acts as a tutorial on how to configure and use unmodified NetBSD kernel drivers as a user space service with utilities available from the NetBSD base system. As part of this, it presents various use cases. Uh, one uses the kernel cryptographic disk driver, or CGD, to encrypt this partition. Uh, another one demonstrates how to operate an FFS server for editing the contents of a file system, even though your user account does not have privileges to use the host's mount system call. And additionally, using a user space TCP IP server with an unmodified web browser uh, is also detailed. So you can jump to individual sections uh, in this one. But uh, each one has a uh, detailed description and uh, go commands to put in. And some of the outputs are also provided in case um, something is uh, needed to be seen on the screen. And yeah, that's a pretty straightforward tutorial on how to setting up a RAM kernel server and doing interesting things with it. Yeah, uh, using FFS, which is the older version of UFS, um from user space so that you don't have to have access to the mount syscall to do stuff could be very useful for image generation. If you're, say, compiling and, and building an image for a Raspberry Pi uh, and don't have root, um, it can be hard to make, you know, an MD, uh, a memory disk device, and then, you know, partition it and write all the, the file system to it because you don't have access to the mount commands and UFS and so on. Uh, but if you can emulate all that in user space, uh, and you can open a file, um, then you could do most of that by running that mostly uh, privileged code in the context of only your user space. Mm -hmm. uh, which is quite interesting. And I'm not sure exactly what the TCP IP uh, bits would do, but uh, it's kind of interesting to see how you would combine those and do interesting things. Yes, and especially the setup time in milliseconds is uh, an interesting prospect. Really? So this is if you're uh, basically booting this mini operating system that's running in user space, then yeah, it boots up really quick. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have a lot of hardware to bother with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not much devices to configure and load drivers for. Yeah, uh, you know, as Colin found when he did the, the boot time survey on FreeBSD, a lot of the time is spent, you know, poke a device and then wait to see, you know, has it left a message for me to go pick up or whatever. You know, it, or hmm. Reboot the keyboard, now wait. Wait, wait, okay, now the keyboard's ready to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, that overall takes uh, a lot of time on a big server. Mm -hmm. So yeah, try this out and uh, see if it's useful for you. All right, and the last story during the roundup is installing Snort on OpenBSD 6.4. As you may recall from previous posts, uh, 
the FunctionallyParanoid.com author, uh, is running OpenBSD server on his APU2, uh, which is a little air-cooled uh, box with three Intel NICs, and using that as his firewall and router for his secure home network. Uh, given that all of the internet traffic flows through this box, I thought it would be a cool idea to run an intrusion detection system, or IDS, on it. Uh, Snort is a big hog of an open source uh, project, uh, so I took a peek in the packages directory on one of the mirrors, and lo and behold, we have the latest and greatest version of Snort available uh, for OpenBSD. So thanks to the developers and uh, supporters. Um, so he said I, he did some quick Googling and uh, couldn't find much uh, of a modern how-to on how to get this running on OpenBSD. So after some trial and error, uh, they got it up and running. And I thought I'd uh, give back in a small way by sharing this quick tutorial how-to so that other people that are Googling in the future might actually uh, find something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a relatively straightforward process to get the package up and running. You basically just run package add snort to install it. Uh, and because it's already been packaged up, that deals with most of it. And you get a startup script created so that you can uh, tell it to start at boot and so on. And you just have to tell it where to find its uh, definition files, the DAQ files, uh, which basically defines what the suspicious traffic looks like so it can match that. Uh, and we need to tell the network uh, which network interface is the internal side and which is the external side and so on. So we put uh, some stuff in the configuration file and uh, then you just need to set up some smart rules or sorry, snort rules. Um, there's a free community rule set uh, and you can use all new rules uh, basically 30 days after they're available to the people that pay uh, or you can pay the $30 per year to get access to the new rules right away. Mm. Okay. Um, but you just rcctl enable snort, uh, set the flags so that it knows which interfaces to look at and how long it needs uh, to do it. And then when you bring your router back up with all that, uh, snort is monitoring your traffic and anything untoward uh, will show up in your var snort log directory as either in, uh, in the alert log or the snort log. Uh, you can find out, you know, what your, uh, how you want to adjust your monitoring for your logs and notify you about when something bad happens. In addition, there is a tool that will uh, keep your snort rules up to date automatically so that, you know, if you're using the free version 30 days after a new rule comes out, it can be added to your collection. Uh, as I said, this tutorial is pretty short and sweet, but it's because it's so easy to get snort up and running. Yes, and even though small tutorials are helpful for people who are just wanting to know, how do I set this up? This must be complicated. And then they see that it's just a couple of lines or a little bit of config. And then, ah, then they have something running. Mm -hmm. Time for Beastie Bits this week, starting off with OS 108. Yeah, so, so this is a, a desktop-oriented version of NetBSD uh, targeted towards people that want to replace Windows or Mac OS. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Interesting to see uh, someone start with NetBSD when trying to, to target more uh, desktop users, but uh, you know, maybe it's uh, specifically targeted at people that want to run it on older hardware. Uh, you know, many computers nowadays where there's no supported operating system uh, that uh, from Microsoft or Apple that you could run on it. Uh, so they have a little FAQ including why they picked the name OS 108. Apparently, the 1 and 0 are the binary bits, which represent the eight different forms of a byte. Uh, and also, the distance uh, to Earth from the sun is about 108 times the diameter of the sun, hence the name. And the, hmm. the logo is called the Vyom, uh, which is stands for space. Oh, okay. So, yeah, uh, there okay. are ISO images that, available. Mm -hmm. be interesting to see where that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have a YouTube video from the AT&T archives, the Unix operating system. Yeah, some of these uh, old videos are pretty entertaining, uh, including the graphics, especially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but talking about, you know, uh, making computers more productive using Unix. 
Uh, cause you know, that was actually a thing at the time. Oh uh, yeah. But very 1980s style videos. Uh, and they're quite amusing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a couple of hundred years, they will watch our videos and then think these were, <laughs> these were crazy, but, um, <laughs> we're not there yet. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a little bit of nostalgia here. Yeah. Uh, speaking and of then, entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Our next item is uh, adapt to industry-wide current best practices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> industry-wide current best practices. Uh, so they at... <laughs> uh, hard-coded into the OpenBSD HTTPD. Uh, if the user agent uh, happens to contain the string curl, then return 403 forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> yep so that's a good change <laughs> because security yeah no one wants <laughs> wants that to happen uh, uh, that's not actually real that's just an April Fool's joke and I guess we were a bit late getting to it but uh, not my fault Yeah, we, we wanted to, to mention it still so that yeah, people so was a good one, have so. a little fun <laughs> um, and then we have quotes from a book that bashes Unix Huh. Yes. Uh, People are including saying already... things like uh, <laughs> contributors compared Unix to a virus. Unix possesses Ooh. all the hallmarks of a uh, all the hallmarks of a highly successful virus. In its original incarnation, it was very small and had few features. Uh, the minimality of the design was paramount because it lacked features that would make it a real operating system, such as memory map files, high speed input output, a robust file system, uh, the record file, a uh, record file, and device locking. Uh, rational inter-process communication, et cetera, ad nauseum. But it meant it was portable. Uh, a more functional operating system would have been less portable. Unix feeds off the energy of its host. Without a system administrator babysitting Unix, it regularly panics, dumps core, and halts. <laughs> Unix frequently uh, mutates, cludges, and fixes uh, to make one version behave won't work well on another version. If Andromeda Strain had been software, it would have been Unix. Uh, Unix is a computer virus with a user interface. <laughs> it's hey, a, yep. uh, kind of unkind things to say about Unix. Uh, talking a bit about the design, they say, ironically, the very attributes and design goals that make Unix a success when computers were much smaller uh, and were expected to do far less now impede its utility and usability. Uh, each graft of a new sy uh, subsystem onto the underlying core has resulted in either rejection of the graft versus uh, host disease with its uh, contaminant proliferations of incarnation uh, scar tissue. The Unix networking model is a cacophony uh, or cacophonous babble of unreliability that quadruples the size of the Unix famed compact kernel. Its Windows system inherited the cryptic unfriendliness of a character-based interface while at the same time um, realizing new ways to bring fast computers to a crawl. Its new system administration tools take more time to use than they save. Its mailer makes the U.S. Postal Service look positively stellar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Somehow I don't think we would be where we are today without Unix mail actually working. So I'm not yes. sure what this guy's on about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's a typical story about file deletion in Unix systems. I too have a, had a similar disaster using RM. Once I was removing a file system from my disk, or, or a file system, yeah, from my disk, uh, which was something like slash user slash foo slash bin, uh, I was in slash user slash foo, and I had removed several parts from the system by rm r dot slash etc and uh, rm r dot slash adm and so on. But when it came time to do dot slash bin, I missed the period. System didn't like that too much. So Unix wasn't designed to live after the mortal blow of losing its slash bin directory. An intelligent operating system would have given the user a chance to recover, or at least confirm whether he really wanted to render the operating system inoperable. No. It's really annoying when it does that. <laughs> you do what I say. It's, I, I know what I'm doing. This mm. food shooting is a thing I want. Yes, so I do believe most of this person's anger with Unix came from uh, having used it badly. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But writing a book out about it, it's uh, already the next stage. <laughs> and then uh, for the next story, uh, we have uh, uh, looks like an unofficial-ish wiki uh, for the new OpenBSD QA system or, ah. or something. 
Uh, so the goal of this wiki is to provide a comprehensive set of tests that can be used to assess the quality of uh, the, tr the OpenBSD tree at any time. Uh, so it includes uh, running static analysis, looking for API and ABI changes, looking for resource leaks, uh, testing the, uh, the testing environment, you know, how to run the tests, what d device drivers uh, is actually testing, fuzz testing, uh, tool testing, adding new tests, porting tests from other operating systems, conformance testing, uh, and also doing uh, metrics like cyclomatic complexity and code coverage testing and so on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, I'm especially interested in uh, more automated uh, API slash ABI change uh, testing because uh, it's definitely something we would like to use uh, on the stable branches in FreeBSD to notice when, oh, the change we just merged back to FreeBSD 11 uh, broke uh, one of the guaranteed stable interfaces and we need to undo that and, and approach it a different way. Yes. And many of the tests could probably also be run on other uh, BSDs. So there are similarities enough so that the, uh, tests don't have to be rewritten if they have similar um, software to test or uh, interfaces or APIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, uh, like if you click through that one, actually, they have uh, on the API ABI testing and then open SSH. Um, mm -hmm. They have a graph and they actually show for each version of open SSH how backwards compatible it is, how many new things were added, and how many things were removed. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot. Interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, so check it out and maybe contribute a couple of tests back to OpenBSD so that helps their QA effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go right into our feedback and questions section for this week. And as always, if you want to have this section uh, continue, then you should send us questions. Anything that you found, uh, anything that you are uh, curious about or don't understand, then give us a little mail at feedback at bsdnow.tv and... Uh, then we'll cover it in future episodes in exactly this spot. Uh, the first one who did this uh, is Malcolm with uh, Laptop Experience, a question about the Dell XPS 13 in particular, and goes like this. In a recent show, a listener was asking for a laptop discussion, and I'd like to toss my experience there as well. I'm using the 2018 model Dell XPS 13 mode, 9370, he thinks. Uh, the laptop is awesome. It's well-built and small, the battery life is great, but there are some quirks in there that one has to be willing to put up with. So some specifics. Networking needs work. Built-in Wi-Fi doesn't work, unfortunately. It's being worked on, but he has no idea if it will be supported. Uh, he uses a Wi-Fi dongle, which works well enough for him to uh, have it not being lame and slow. And yeah, the next um, thing. So Wi-Fi Broadcom has always been a pain in that regard. Uh, it's too bad mm -hmm. that... Dell doesn't use Intel Wi-Fi. Um, progress is being made, but yeah, it's hard to say. Mm. And he has not had uh, looked hard, but he has yet to find a USB-C Ethernet dongle that works with FreeBSD. Using a USB-C dongle, he connects a regular USB Ethernet adapter, and that works fine. I have to check because I did get a USB-C Ethernet dongle that works on my Mac, and I'm pretty sure it worked fine under FreeBSD. Uh, but I will double check that. Because I don't want to tell mm. you to go buy that one if it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mostly use the USB-C port on my laptop to charge my Lenovo with my Mac charger. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carrying one, one charger instead of two is is better. <laughs> yes, then he goes on to the graphics part. Uh, pretty good, he writes. When watching video at full screen, I do see refresh lines or whatever they are called. So it's not as good as watching as on a Mac or a Windows machine, but good enough for him. Yeah, okay, I, I see the same on my uh, X220 that's strapped to my exercise bike. Uh, and I've not looked into what I can do to make it not do that. Mm. Uh, screen brightness works, and he has not gotten the webcam working, but haven't worked hard at it. So um, that's about... Somebody should do a nice tutorial on Webcam D on how to get that working. Uh, I've done it before and got it working, but I don't remember mm -hmm. what I did. Um because I've used the webcam on my older Lenovo before, not this one. I have not tried this one. Um, but I've definitely used uh, Lenovo USB webcams under FreeBSD very successfully. Uh, we do this at work all the time. Uh, 
But yes, mm. if, if somebody is interested in helping out with something, uh, a little tutorial on using Webcam D and maybe uh, OBS, Open Broadcaster Studio, uh, to stream from your webcam uh, would be a good tutorial. Yep. Then he continues with the sound. Uh, needs work, but he hasn't tried hard on it. Uh, speakers work fine, although not super loud. He's almost always at 80 to 90% volume. I and... might try the mixer command. Uh, ah, yes. And sometimes it defaults to 50, and if you boost that one, then the other volume control won't have to be quite so high and you'll get less distortion or whatever. It can depend. Mm. And he has not gotten sound to work phone. Uh, so uses with the headphones, his phone for such things. Um, there are some patches that went in recently for that you might be able to go back to, but I think it's a matter of uh, there's a sysctl to tell it which pins do what uh, or something, and it's required so that when you plug the headphones in, it switches the sound over. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, microphone is also not working, but he has no use for it at this time, so... Um, that's okay. So spend and resume. That's what most people are looking for. Mostly works. Uh, about one hour of every 40 resumes, it hangs. Oh, no, sorry, not hour. About one of every 40 resumes, it hangs, and uh, he needs to reboot. Uh, this is a known issue, and someone is working on it when they have time. Something to do with NVMe resuming. Ah, so the main issue I have with NVMe resuming on my machine, although it's probably a different NVMe, uh, is that sometimes... It takes about five seconds for the NVMe to wake back up or actually to time out and be reset to wake up. Uh, and so the disk doesn't actually work for the first five seconds after resuming, but that's not that big a deal. Okay. Um, I have I think I've seen a, a fail to resume one time uh, and it was a bit weird. Uh, and then the next thing, uh, he says uh, one in every 60 times or so he has a fail to suspend. I had that one one time uh, it was at BSD Cam actually when I was sitting beside one of the graphics people, so it was handy. <laughs> but I suspended it, and like the power light started blinking and everything, like it was suspended, but my screen was still lit up with what was on my screen. So the okay. laptop thought it was suspended, but it wasn't, or something. It was very strange. Uh, <laughs> and so the email goes on to say, "This really sucks because you can't even test to see if it's suspended without unsuspending it. Uh, mostly, this happens rarely enough uh, that I don't care too much." Um, but it reminds me of the problem Colin Percival saw with his at one point where uh, he had told it to shut down, but he closed the lid before it had quite finished shutting down. And so it suspended instead, and his laptop got, or, or maybe it didn't suspend even, uh, his laptop got really hot in his backpack when he thought it was off. Ooh, yeah. That can cause issues. So yeah, um, that's their step. The dead state. And in the other section he has, I do a lot of work on Linux, so I run on Beehive. Uh, works great. And screen sharing on Hangouts work, but Microsoft team wants a plugin installed, which he hasn't done yet. Uh, he has not tried Slack or Riot, but for the most part, any video calls he does on his phone anyway, so the laptop is not used for that. Cool. Okay, that's a good feedback. So um, yeah, if uh, people you know, are interested. Chris Moore joins our Google Hangout from a FreeBSD machine, and it works. Mm -hmm. which is good yeah and the quality is decent enough to mm -hmm. to see and understand him so that seems to be getting better okay uh thanks malcolm for that and uh, next up is dj with uh, feedback uh goes like this uh, about another viewer's comment on linux slash bsd rivalry uh, it is worth noting that there are kernel user land crossover projects that may run a GNU user land on a bsd kernel or linux kernel with bsd tools I'm not sure what the benefits are, but people do like having those choices. Yeah, like um, uh, you can install most, or you can install all the Unix user land stuff on a FreeBSD, and it'll work um, either by compiling it natively, uh, so you know you can actually have uh, GNU awk, GNU said, you know, there's basically G, the command of version of all of those tools. Uh, available because sometimes installer uh, scripts or something will depend on using GNU awk rather than BSD one true awk and so on. Um, and so those exist. And yes, I, I've definitely seen the De Debian projects that are a free BSD kernel with the ZFS and then the rest of the GNU user land for people that were used to that or whatever. Mm. And so in his experience, Linux and BSD and other Unix variants for desktop users uh, had more commonly aligned interests in the past than they do recently. 
This probably stemmed from proprietary software not supporting open platforms. Uh, the Floss community would actively develop portable slash cross-platform Floss alternatives and other vocal advocates, usually in the Linux camp, would pressure software vendors to open up or at least support Linux. Usually, the whole Floss ecosystem would benefit from these activities. Lately, at least since the emergence of certain closed platforms becoming popular with Linux desktop users like Google Chrome, Google Hangouts, Voice and Video, Skype, Slack, Spotify, and the list goes on, and other less portable open source technologies dominate Linux desktop, Electron, various Chrome-only web apps, Flash, still, uh, hideous bash scripts with Linux blobs for certain distro, etc. Uh, the vocal Linux advocates do not seem to care as much if other open platforms, including Linux distros that do not support Systemd, Electron, Snappy, cannot run these. Yeah, it seems that uh, a lot of the people that were very, everything needs to be open so we can use it. Uh, have have given up that fight now that it works for them, and they mm-hmm. don't care about everybody anymore. Right there um, seems more and more Linux people are are siding with practicality rather than I actually need my software to be free. Yeah, works for me, not yeah. P- you know, pity that when it didn't work for, for them, yeah. everything needed to be free and open. But as long as the blob works for them, they're they're fine with it now. <laughs> Yeah, they could be a little bit more sharing and uh, helping each other in that regard. Uh, so there's also um, a new semi-pragmatic bunch of Linux desktop advocates uh, now who do not care about open source as long as proprietary apps run on Linux desktops so that everybody and their grandmas can switch to Linux on their desktop for some reason just to continue running an entirely proprietary stack on top of Linux. I'm not sure what the end game is there, but it has changed how open source desktops work nowadays. Projects that care about open source are often left in the cold. Ironically, with the many troubles of GPL3 complexity and uncertainty and the BSD license being more permissive, uh, I would think that a desktop platform running on TrueOS plus Trident or something BSD-based would be a friendlier home for proprietary app development if people really cared about proprietary apps on a desktop. These days, virtualization is always an option as well, including Beehive, VirtualBox, QEMU, Zen, and uh, Hexam, which came up recently. Uh, Closing the loop there, I agree with Alan and Benedict that the rivalry is mostly friendly and there is a lot of exchange, although lopsided. I think visibility and advocacy are also still big hurdles for BSD, as many people simply do not know about it let alone uh, how awesome it still is, and that most open-source Linux software compiles and runs natively just fine on most BSDs. Or if it doesn't, it could with just a couple of small changes. And uh, so that's why the advocacy stuff is so important. We need to you know, go to Linux user groups and Linux developer meetups and Linux conferences and make sure that they know the BSDs are there and they're willing to help. And if the Linux people are open to just taking a couple of changes, uh, their software could be worked uh, work in more places. Yeah, and so well, it's it's a constant uh, engagement with people and telling them yes, this is not finished, or it should also work here, not just only on, on your system, so that there's a lot more people who can uh, benefit from that. And there's sharing, and things get contributed upstream and and back to people, so it's not just a one way street. Yeah, and we're having the same conversation in the the ZFS leadership calls now. Of all right. Um, we want to stop individual platforms from making unilateral decisions that the rest of the platforms are going to have to live with because it's already done. Uh, so we're going to have these discussions, but the discussions can only include those who are going to show up. Uh, so you know, if FreeBSD wants more input on what happens uh, in the future of ZFS, then people need to show up. And luckily, uh, in the ZFS calls, we have Alexander Moten, Josh Petzl, uh, and myself and a bunch of other uh, FreeBSD ZFS people making sure that ZFS or that FreeBSD's interests are expressed there, and that you know as we continue to build out uh, Open ZFS, that it works on all the platforms, and that the design decisions consider all the platforms when they're being built as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that it's not just. Uh, but yeah, for uh, for the Linux desktop stuff, it basically requires BSD to show up, which we did for a while and then didn't for a while and are trying again. Uh, and so it's important that we actually show up uh, and and make sure that people at projects like Mesa and KDE and GNOME and so on uh, consider that we still exist and that uh, there's value to, to them in working with BSD. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, 
Next up is Alex uh, with GhostBSD and Wi-Fi fixed. So that's a follow-up to a previous question, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so he writes, I was able to follow up the advice in this crappy video <laughs> to edit the bootloader con file. So there's a YouTube video he's referring to. Uh, then I followed the instructions on GhostBSD wiki uh, with the link there with the Wi-Fi doesn't work entry. Yeah. So the loader.conf entry is probably loading the firmware for the Wi-Fi device. Uh, newer Wi-Fi devices... Uh to save money, don't include some flash memory to hold the firmware. Um, and this way, the operating system just loads firmware from a file, uh, and it means it's easier to update as well. Um, but it means if it's not loaded, your Wi-Fi card doesn't work. Mm. Okay, and then you have to edit your WPA supplicant file in slash etc uh, with a couple of entries. So maybe that's helpful to someone um, missing just those bits to make yep. it work. Thanks okay. for the follow-up. Nice. And that pretty much wraps up our episode this week. Uh, next week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest, as always, from the BSD uh, ecosystem. And uh, until then, if you have something found yourself or have a question, again, send it to feedback at bsdnow.tv, and then we'll see you next week. See you next week.